Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans, chapter 13, 8 through 14. Paul reminds us that the life of a Christian is love in action. Hear the voice of God in these holy words. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, as we come to this time where we reflect on the word that you've given us for today, I ask, Lord, that you remove everything that's me, that you remove everything that hinders any one of us from hearing your voice. Help us, Lord, to, to hear your spirit as we study this. Help us, Lord, to, to be open to those places where we need to grow and those places where we need to be still. Above all, Lord, I, I pray that you help us to focus on your voice and your presence in this time. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. As I was reading through this, um, and thinking through this this morning, I, I realized that the final words that would be spoken before I walked up here was gratify the desires of the flesh. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's a great place to start. So we're going to switch gears and go back to the beginning of that passage. Um, but I want to begin with a personality test. And this personality test only has one question, and it's, it's simply a yes or no question. But you have to answer yes or no by raising your hands. So the one question is... Are you a rule follower? If you are, raise your hand. Yes. If you're not, raise your hand no. Okay. <laughs> One raised his hand with great pride over here. Okay, we've got some that are going both ways. I did notice, because we can actually see you, that there were some of you that did not raise your hand, so I assume that you are not rule followers, because the rule was you had to raise your hand at some point. So you still answered, just so you know. Um, I am most definitely a rule follower. I love rules. Um, when I went through my rebellious phase, um, I, my, my act of rebellion was to come home late, to miss curfew by five or 10 minutes. Never really 15, but I was late, by golly. I wasn't gonna let them tell me what to do. I do remember when I was in middle school, um, one time I put my flip-flops in the little basket on my bike because that, those were too casual and we weren't allowed to wear flip-flops. My parents wouldn't let us wear flip-flops to school, so I took them on my bike and I was gonna switch into them when I got to school. And then I got scared and I left them in my bike and they got stolen. So, um, so it didn't, you know, and not much has changed. I still like rules, um, but I do wear flip-flops all the time now. Um, so to see, I am rebel rebelling even at this point. Uh, but my need to understand and follow rules has continu continued into my faith life. 
I know I've said it before, but, but I can't emphasize enough how much I like the lists in the Bibles, in the Bible of, of all the different rules. I like being able to look at them and, and check them off and say, I fo I'm following this one, I've got this one, I'm doing that one okay. But I also like the ones where I say, I can see it and say, well, okay, that's something I need to work on. It gives me structure in my life and in my faith life, so um, I really, I like to do that. But there was a time in my life where it was my goal to obey every single rule. Because if I did that, then God would welcome me with open arms. I've realized that my relationship with God is much more complex than the rules that I'm following um, and, the, and some kind of cosmic scorecard that I used to imagine. The radical shift in, my, in this faith life came when I realized that if God loved me enough to um, look more d deeply into my soul and into my life than the legalities of, of the rules that are written on the page, then, then I needed to be looking at others with that same grace and that same compassion. I needed to offer more grace than I offered judgment. And our scripture reading this morning um, was actually a major part of that. When I read the words, every, um, every law depends, uh, is based on this. The 13th chapter of Romans begins with Paul reminding the Christians that they were still under the authority of the government. Uh, just like today, uh, the people didn't like to pay taxes, and they didn't want to obey a government that had different values than they did. Um, it was a, a, a common issue amongst, the, amongst everybody. So Paul very lovingly, and yet very bluntly, told them that if they didn't respect and obey the, those who were in authority over them, then they were resisting what God had put in place. So obviously this was an issue for the people in the early church uh, because Paul had to address it, but he did it in just a, a couple of, of quick um, instructions. Yes, you have to do that. Now, now that's done. Those are easy to, to quantify and, and um, explain. But he very quickly moved back into instructions. He springboarded off of that into instructions for holy living, which is how we publicly... Um, interact and, and, uh, and are politically involved in a, in a community. The beginning of today's reading is this beautiful segue that he did uh, from the literal debt of taxes and secular responsibilities into our spiritual debt and responsibilities. So starting with verse 8, he says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, the Greek word that is used in this passage is plerao. And this is the same word that Jesus used back in Matthew 5, 17 when he said, I haven't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. He used the same passage saying that's why he came as is being used to tell us that love is the fulfillment of the law. The word, when it's translated in Matthew because of the other words that are around it, it can be translated to mean um, consummate or accomplish. So Jesus accomplished, he fulfilled, he, he made the law whole by, by his, act, his presence and his act of sacrifice. But he reminds us in this letter that, um, that we are to continue what Jesus has done. That we are, um, that Jesus broadened the understanding of what laws mean. There's so many times Jesus said, you've heard it said, um, an eye for an eye. Or you've heard it said, uh, you shall not murder. But I tell you if, you, if you talk to somebody disrespectfully, if you call them a name or put them down, it's the same thing as murder. You can apply that law of love to that. Because when you, if you love someone, you're not going to call them hateful names or do, 
or destroy their person. So that this, the word um, plerao reminds us that following rules is not the same as being grounded in love. When we love our neighbor, then we have completely obeyed the law. And, and Paul goes on to list a few of the commandments, the easiest ones to understand um, how love would prevent the sin. But something that, that we need to remember is that every command from God is rooted in love. The Ten Commandments can be um, divided into two different categories. The first four are about our relationship with God and how we function as, um, as children of God, uh, with God and, and with our faith. But then the other four um, are about how we interact with one another. Um, and there are a lot of other laws in the Old Testament, um, and in each one can be found in its basis, in its root, um, love. And it's easy, it's so easy to see how if you really loved someone, you couldn't murder them, like we were talking about with the kids. If you really loved them, you couldn't steal from them. Um, so those are the easy commandments to see it in. But, but, what, but what about lying? You know, I think sometimes we, we tell the little white lies because we love someone. Uh, the one that came to mind immediately when I was thinking about this is, is when we as women ask uh, men, does this outfit make me look fat? Uh, which we all know is a trap. And the men know that they're supposed to say no, no matter what, right? And yet, uh, even though it might be uncomfortable for a while, I think most people would rather hear the truth. If I really want to know how something looks and if it's something I want to wear in public, I will ask my daughter because she will be brutally honest. Um, lovingly, I'm sure, but she is 100% honest. Um, so I know that I can trust her when she says, no, that's okay, you can go out in that. Usually she'll just pick another outfit for me, but, um, but I know that I can trust her. Uh, but evading the truth is, is seldom helpful or loving in the long run. God understands human nature, and I am so thankful for that. Um, so God provides for us a framework for health and for safety. And that's what the laws are. But just like today, um, the laws can be used to abuse or oppress people, to, to make people conform to our idea of, of what should happen. It's easy for us, uh, it was easy for them in, in the time of Jesus, and it's easy for us today to allow the laws to become more important than the, peop than the purpose of the law was originally intended. But in just a few sentences, Paul remi remi reminds the faithful believers, which includes um, all of us, that God's laws are in place out of love for us. To help us, to help us, but also to help us love one another. The laws are important, but they're not so important um, that they take precedence over loving each other. He goes on to emphasize, though, immediately after explaining that, he goes on to emphasize that that the need to live a lifestyle that is pleasing to God, that is uh, gives glory and honor to God. Uh, is more important than trying to please ourselves. Which is where that sentence comes in that I didn't want to end up on, but I did for some reason. Um, but then this, so then we have, so that's our first scripture reading for today. The second scripture reading seems to go in a totally different direction. Um, we've just focused on the importance of loving one another and um, not hurting them. And then we have this mass, Matthew passage that we're going to read in just a minute, and it's all about what to do when someone, uh, another believer, is sinning. Um, and, and I chose to begin with the Romans passage because um, I do believe that accountability begins with self-evaluation. There's that list of behaviors that is common enough that we see that same list in several places in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And if you read any book on ministry, you'll find pretty much the same list um, uh, in those books. The, the list includes, in this passage, but it's not limited to carousing, drunkenness, sexual immorality, debauchery, dissension. Um, and dissension, I mean, that's as simple as going around saying, did you hear what so-and-so said? 
just to get someone else as angry as you are. Um, so that's the one that, uh, maybe it's just me, but that's the one that stumps me every time. I'm like, oh, I'm on the list. Um, and then jealousy. So before we can worry about the sins of other people, before we can go and start pointing our fingers, we have to, to look through this, honestly look through this list and see where we fall in this. We need to check our own life and see if there's something in our life that's more focused on my own pleasure than on God's pleasure. But our scripture reading, the Matthew scripture, um, is Matthew 18, and it's verses 15 through 20. It says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault to just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by testimony of two or three witnesses. Um, and the reason that's in quotes is because that is also, that's scripture that they've already been taught. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So I find it interesting that these two scriptures were, were put together in the lectionary. Um, the lectionary is a group of four scriptures. It'll always have Old Testament, a psalm, a New Testament, a gospel reading, and a letter. Um, and so pastors can sit and read the four scriptures and decide which of those they want to speak on for the day. And I found it interesting that they had these two passages. And when I first read them, I thought, oh, so the, the pastors who really like judgment, um, they can pick the Romans, I mean, the Matthew passage. And those who really like grace and feel good, they can pick the Romans passage and then everyone's happy. You can go where you're comfortable. Um, or it would be easy to read those two scriptures and say they contradict each other, so we don't have to pay attention to either one. Neither one of them holds truth. So I continued to read these two passages together to hear what God was, uh, wanted me to say today. And I realized that instead of contradicting each other, these two scriptures help complete or complement each other. Uh, a pastor friend of mine is obviously preaching on the, on the lectionary because she, this week in, on Facebook she posted, Mother Teresa said, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. I agree and assert that the flip side is true. If we love people, we have no time to judge them. Um, and I love, I love both the quote and what uh, my friend Valerie said. When you put these two passages together, I think they help us understand that the first passage isn't telling us to judge others, um, but instead to love them. The Matthew passage, if you look at it literally, I mean, if you look at it and, and don't think about it, it can appear as if it's encouraging people to judge others. But Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to do away with the law. So the rules are in place. But it says that we are called to love our neighbors, and in doing that, then we can fulfill the law. So if we think of that, then we can read the Matthew passage with grace and with love rather than judgment. If my brother or sister is hurting himself or herself or someone else, then it's, the loving action would be to step in and have a conversation with them. Help them see that what they're doing is, is harmful. The scripture says, and I love this, it's a wonderful model. The scripture says you go to them one-on-one. -on -one. You do it privately. And, um, and, and hopefully that'll do the job. But if it doesn't, then you go and you, and you get one or two more to come have the conversation. And I kind of think that that might also be a stopgap. Because if I see something and I go to a friend and I say, I need you to come have this conversation with me and, and um, Joe Schmo. Um, and I explain what's happening, and that person says, well, that's not a sin. I understand why they're doing it. Then maybe it, the problem was in me. And now it's my responsibility to go back and apologize for, for speaking where I shouldn't. Um, but if not, then we have the conversation together. The next one is the one I've always struggled with, because it says if they still don't get it, then you take it to the church. 
And I've always struggled with that because I've pictured this kind of church. And I pictured a pastor standing in front of the congregation and saying, Brother Joe did blah, 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 and we need to hold him accountable. And I didn't like that. And then I remembered that the, the churches in the time that the letter was written were smaller churches, and they were held in people's homes. So it would have been more like going to a Sunday school class and saying someone is risking their health, their job, their relationship. We need to support them and love them through this, not judge them and condemn them. Um, but it can be a very loving conversation. Now here comes a part that I have, if I could have had a Sharpie pen at some point and scratched it out of my Bible, this one would have gone. Um, it's the next passage where it says, if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Because in my mind, for whatever reason, that meant we kick them out of the church. And they're not welcome back in the church until they've straightened up their ways and they're flying straight. And then I remembered Jesus. And I remembered who Jesus spent the most time and the most grace with. And that was the pagans and the tax collectors. They were his friends. But he poured out grace and he poured out love. There, was, there wasn't as much... Uh, condemnation. There wasn't condemnation with them. There was love and a call back into relationship. So instead of treating these people as outcasts, instead we have different expectations and we pour out love and grace in a different way. Here's something I know without a doubt. That loving your neighbor requires putting the needs of others above personal comfort. I had to fire an employee several years ago, many, many years ago, because of several acts of poor judgment on his part. Um, along the way, I had tried. I never had the conversation with him. Instead, I tried to like put things in place that would um, encourage him to do what I wanted him to do or, or would would make it almost impossible for certain behavior. Um, so I basically tried to manipulate the situation so, so things changed, rather than having that conversation. But then one day, he just went too far. And, um, and I had to fire him immediately. And he was a good friend of mine, was what made that really hard. So at that point, I had to be really honest with him. And uh, I explained everything that had happened leading up to this. I explained in, in detail why this was an offense that was worthy of, of him stepping down from his position. If I had been willing to have the hard conversation all along the way, if I had been willing to encourage him um, all along the way, then, then he would have understood, potentially, and been able to change how he interacted and neither he nor the program would have been hurt. I wasn't willing to put his need for growth above my need for um, everybody liking me at that point, to be honest. If we love someone, we have to be willing to risk losing their friendship. You know, I don't know if other parents have said it to their children. I said it when my kids were all in their teen years and were so much fun to be around. There were times that I would say, I love you too much to care if you hate me right now. I'm willing to take that step. Um, it's easy to do it with our children because we love them that much. God calls us to love all of God's children that much. I have to be willing to risk losing a, a friendship if it's going to save their life if it's going to save their job or their relationships. And this is the hardest thing, I think, about being the family of faith. Uh, but it's also one of the best parts. Because one of the reasons Jesus calls us to be in community, to come together as a, a, the body of, of Christ, is because when we're together, we, we can love each other and we can support each other as we continue to grow in faith. It's a responsibility, uh, but it's also a gift. Because I know that if I start straying outside of what God wants for my life, which is only going to bring me um, pain in the end, that I have brothers and sisters in this room and around the world who will say, Michelle, God loves you too much to let you 
continued with that. It's a joy, it's a gift, but it's our responsibility. God calls us to come together. God calls us to love one another and support one another. God calls us to love and God calls us to live in a way that brings glory and honor to God in all that we do. Let's pray. Almighty God, there are times that, that your scriptures are, aren't the tap dance that I like to read. There are times when your scripture points me and draws me into a dangerous territory. Sometimes it's really scary, God, to, to be a faithful Christian. I pray, Lord, that, that as we continue to reflect over your scriptures, that we hear your Holy Spirit speak to us. That we hear the words that, that call us to be bold, to be righteous. I pray, Lord, that, that you help us to see how we can love with the perfect love that you pour out on us. Help us, Lord, to, to wrestle with your word. Please, Lord, help us to be faithful.